And as you're seated, I would invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15. And this morning, as you find Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 15, I'm going to tell you a short story about the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther. Uh, Martin Luther was one of the uh, most consequential and important theologians and thinkers in in world history. Uh, He was also plagued by feelings of inadequacy, fear, sadness, and guilt his entire life. And at one point in his career, he locked himself in his room, closed the curtains so that no light could come in, and refused to eat or drink much of anything. Uh, He refused to talk to anyone, uh, really, other than to say some version of, I am the worst person in the world, I can't do anything right, I just want to die. And after a couple of weeks of this, his wife, the the great Katarina von Bora, one of the true church heroes in church history, she comes into his room dressed for a funeral, black dress, black veil, and Luther looks at her and he asks, who died? And Katarina says back to him, from the way you're acting, it can only mean that my Savior has gone back into the tomb. Luther hears that, gets up, opens the curtains, lets the sunlight in, and has breakfast. Uh, Other than showing you how awesome Katarina von Bora was, uh, why are we talking about this? Well, after this, Luther started a practice that helped him fight those feelings. It's a practice he gave to his students to help them. Uh, And not just to help them when they would enter into what we now call depression, but also to help them be brave as they traveled to dangerous places to share the gospel. Uh, To be generous when they were afflicted with poverty. And also to help them express forgiveness to the people who were even going to kill them because they were on the wrong side of papal politics. What was that practice? Well, he would say, and he would have them say, I am a baptized Christian. I am a baptized Christian. Yeah, you should say it. I am a baptized Christian. That's right. And this was so helpful because of what the Bible says baptism is. The Bible calls sacraments like baptism and the Lord's Supper signs and seals. That's Romans chapter 4. They're signs because they show us what God's grace means for us. And they're also seals. And as a seal, they show us that we belong to God. So in that sense, kids, it's like writing your name on the inside cover of your book or on your favorite toy. This is mine. It belongs to me. When God baptizes you, he says, this is mine. It belongs to me. But there are also seals in the sense that God uses them to give us fresh experiences of his grace, which is why our tradition calls them a means of grace. They're like a delivery truck that God uses to send his grace to us on, which we receive through faith in Jesus, Uh, which means that they help us live for Jesus. They assure us also that Jesus lives with us, which is exactly what Martin Luther needed every day and his students needed. And I think it's what we need every day too. And by the way, it's so quiet now that the nursery started. If you guys want to say amen and so I'm not so thrown off, you feel free. It's not going to bother me at all. Uh, This morning from Colossians chapter 2, We're going to hear that baptism shows us and assures us that through faith in Jesus, we have died and risen with Christ. And therefore, as Martin Luther learned, we can walk with Jesus in thankful freedom. Uh, So let's read Colossians 2, 6 through 15. We'll pray and then we'll reflect on it under these three points. The first is that Jesus has filled us with all we need. And then we'll see that Jesus fills us with his death. Jesus fills us with his life. And then finally, Jesus fills us in order to free us. So uh, let's read now Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. This is God's word. He says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him 
who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Thus far, the reading of what I think can only truly be God's own word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word which you have given and inspired for us. And Lord, we pray now uh, that you would give us uh, ears to hear it, minds to understand it, and hearts to believe it. Father, we pray that the words of my mouth as your preacher and that the meditation of our hearts as those called to hear and respond and embrace and embrace and live out of your word, that it would all be pleasing now in your sight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So the first thing we're going to reflect on this morning is that Jesus has filled us with all that we need. And that's from verses 9 and 10. So a little context to set the stage. Paul is writing to the Christians in Colossae because they are struggling with thinking that what they needed to please God and to walk with him was Jesus and something else. I like to call these Jesus supplements. Uh, many of us take supplements, right? Multivitamins. Vitamin D, vitamin B, why do we do that? Well, because our diet doesn't give us everything we need. We're supplementing what's lacking. The Colossians were under the illusion that they needed Jesus supplements. That aesthetic practices, which is where you hurt yourself, they thought that that would make Jesus forgive them more. Or that membership within a particular group in the church that would make Jesus really love me. That's what actually partly what the desire to get, excuse me, circumcised was all about, which we'll talk about this morning. Or maybe I need to supplement Jesus' strength because he's not really going to protect me. So maybe I need membership in a politically powerful group outside of the church to keep me safe, which is what Paul means by philosophy. So in the ancient world, philosophy wasn't just a bunch of people asking questions about the truth. It wasn't, you know, an interrogation strategy. It was a bunch of clubs that vied for political power and for the protection that came with it. The Colossians believed that these kinds of things were needed to supplement Jesus's forgiveness or his love or his strength. And before we judge them too harshly, let's admit that we have Jesus supplements, right? We can try to supplement Jesus's free forgiveness with our own self-inflicted suffering, denying ourselves food, berating ourselves. I am the stupidest, dumbest, worst person in the world, right? Insulting ourselves like Martin Luther did because we sinned, thinking somehow that through this aesthetic practice of self-flagellation, where you beat yourself, that Jesus will forgive us more. Or we can supplement Jesus by believing that membership in a particular subculture in the church will secure Jesus' love more. And just so you know, old school Presbyterianism, that's the group that I tried to secure Jesus' love more with in my own walk with him. So I'm familiar with this practice too. Uh, Paul says you don't need to supplement Jesus' forgiveness or his love or his strength. Because, as he writes in a few places in Colossians, Jesus is filled with the fullness of God. One place we see that is in verse 9 of our passage this morning, where he says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. All of God is in Jesus. Because if I were to ask my profession of faith kids, is Jesus God? They would say yes, and I would say, is he fully God? And they would say yes. I see them head nods. That's good. We just talked about that this morning. Uh, which means then that when you receive Jesus, you have all of God. God hasn't hidden himself 
in different places. He's fully visible in Jesus. And God hasn't held a part of himself back. Jesus is not missing some part of God's love or strength or forgiveness. No, when you have Jesus, you have all of God. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now from there, look at what Paul says in verse 10. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. The word fullness in verse 9, for in him all the fullness of God, of deity dwells bodily. And the word filled in verse 10, you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. They're the same word. And Paul is making a point by using that word to say that not only is Jesus filled full with God, but that from his fullness he has filled you, his people, with all you need. Specifically, he's filled us full with the forgiveness of our, that our sins need and with all the spiritual life that we need to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that brings us to a second point, which is that we are filled with Christ's death. So to help the Colossians believe this and live this out, Paul does something that I think might surprise us. He talks about circumcision. He talks about baptism. Right? So he says in verses 11 and 12, I'm going to read those again. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So here's what's going on. Circumcision was the sign and seal of God's relationship with Abraham and his people. Paul says that explicitly in Romans chapter 4. It was a sacrament. And it assured Abraham and Israel of their forgiveness and of God's love and of their life with God as members of his covenant of grace family. The Colossian Christians wanted that same assurance, understandably, right? But they misunderstood two things about how to get it. First, they wrongly believed that they didn't have those things unless they were circumcised. And that's a common misunderstanding that people have about sacraments. We can believe that we don't have Jesus unless we have the sacrament. But that's wrong. If you think about birth, or specifically kind of a few moments after birth, a birth certificate is a sign and seal that this baby is yours, right? It's a sign, this is your baby, and it's a seal. This is my baby, right? But before you have the birth certificate, do you have the baby? Yes, right? Barring any complications, you're holding your baby. The baby's already yours. You have your child in your arms. And in some ways, baptism in the New Testament and circumcision in the Old Testament is like a birth certificate. They tell us that God loves us, that we're forgiven, that we're a part of his family, but they aren't creating that relationship. They're simply affirming and blessing the relationship that's already there. And that's what sacraments do. They affirm and they bless the people that God has brought into his family through Jesus. The Colossians also apparently didn't know that their baptism was the equivalent of circumcision. So they thought they needed to add these things together when in fact baptism was all that they needed because it means the same thing that circumcision did. And now that Jesus has come, baptism accomplishes the very same purposes in the Christian's life. So if you look again at what Paul says in verses 11 through 12, he says, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. So Paul says actually very clearly, you've been circumcised because you've been baptized. In him you were circumcised, having been buried with him in baptism. And this is why in the Reformed tradition we talk about baptism replacing circumcision as a sacrament of the covenant of grace. When we're baptized, we receive the same 
sign and seal that circumcision delivered in the Old Testament. Only what's neat about baptism is uh, that unlike circumcision, everyone gets it. Christian women and Christian men. And just like circumcision, they're children, but not just the boys, the girls too. Now with that said, it's important then for us to look at Paul's bigger point, which is that baptism assures us that Jesus fills us with his death. Because remember, his goal here is not simply to correct their understanding about circumcision and baptism. It's to help them use their baptism to assure them that they don't need Jesus' supplements. So because circumcision and baptism signify and seal the same things, Paul uses circumcision, which they were familiar with, to explain baptism, which they needed more instruction on. So what does circumcision represent? Well, it represents God's relationship and his promises to Abraham. It represents God's love because it reminded Abraham and his children that God chose them as his people. Not because they deserved it or forced God's hand, but because God had set his love on them in the mystery of his grace. Circumcision also represented God's forgiveness. So as we thought about last Sunday, in Genesis 15, God promises to die in Abraham's place in order to forgive his sins. In Genesis 17, God says that circumcision represents that covenant. And by the way, the bloody aspect of circumcision was probably meant to remind them specifically of the promise that God would forgive them through his own shedding of blood. And then finally, circumcision represented God's promise to live with his people forever. It was a sign and seal of God's promise to Abraham that I will be your God and you will be my people. So in that sense, it also shows God's power to protect us so that we can live with him forever. Because what good is a promise that I am the God of the living, I will be your God and you will be my people, if God cannot actually make sure that we will always be his people and always live with him. And all of this is why in our passage then, Paul talks about how through the circumcision of Christ, we have put off the body of flesh. Paul uses that uh, admittedly difficult phrase, the body of flesh, in his writings to talk about our life before Jesus. So our life where we were slaves to sin, and so willingly committed sins that condemned us and kept us from eternal life with God. Paul says that our slavery to sin our condemnation because of our sins and our hate-filled lives have been removed by Jesus because, as he says at the end of verse 13 and the beginning of 14 in some of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament, in Jesus, God has forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. In Jesus... Our sins, God's justice, in our old life have been nailed to the cross and buried with Jesus because we are united to Jesus by faith. And baptism declares this great truth to us that we have been buried with him in baptism. The body of flesh has been killed by Christ. So on brass tacks, do you want to know that your life with Jesus means that your sins are forgiven and that your eternal life with Jesus is assured? And that, as Martin Luther had to be reminded, that when the darkness tells you that God will never be pleased with you, that that darkness has actually lost its power to condemn you because it was killed with Jesus and buried with him in the tomb. If you do, then you need to remember you are a baptized Christian. You have been buried with Jesus. You are forgiven and loved and alive. And that's our next point. Because the Bible says that not only does our baptism assure us that we have been buried 
with Jesus. It also assures us that we've been raised with Jesus. And that's verse 12 into the middle of verse 13. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. So what happens on Easter, as we're going to celebrate in a few short weeks? Jesus rises again from the dead. But he doesn't rise as part of this old creation. He rises, as the Bible says, as part of the new creation, as the firstborn of the new creation. Jesus rises in a body that will never die again because it can never die again. Jesus rises to a life which will never experience temptation to disobedience ever again. Jesus rises to a life where he will never face the danger of rejection again. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He'll never have to pray that prayer ever again. And Jesus rises to a life where his human community will never be broken again because the resurrected human community that he will receive will be like him. Jesus, you see, rises to a life of unendingly joyful, obedient, sinless life with God. And I know Jesus was always sinless, but, but follow me on this point here. Because Paul says that we have been raised with Jesus. And baptism assures us that this is true. And that all of these blessings will be ours. We will be raised to perfection. We will live in unbreakable human community, in an unbreakable relationship with God, in a new heavens and a new earth, sinless, undefiled, and glorious, we will. And just like circumcision was God's pledge to Abraham that he would die for our sins, baptism is God's pledge, a sign of God's pledge to us, that all of those gifts will be ours. But it's not just for the future. It's for the present. Because our relationship with God doesn't start in the future. Right? It starts now. We have God now. We have life with God now. We are, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, already new creations so that we can now, today, live well with God because Jesus is already today filling us with his resurrected life. Which is why, as Paul says in Romans 4, that uh, we can say that while sin remains, it no longer has dominion over us. We are not dead in trespasses and sins anymore. We are made alive in Jesus. We can live for him. So we can say then, I am a baptized Christian, not only when we need assurance that our sins are forgiven, we can say, I am a baptized Christian when we need assurance that we will always live with the Lord, that our hope is not misplaced. And we can also say, I am a baptized Christian when we need strength to obey Jesus and hope that we can, in fact, obey Jesus. Because not only have I been buried with him in baptism, I have been made alive, raised with him too. And that brings me to our final point this morning. Baptism is a sign and seal that gives us the freedom to walk with Jesus. So back at the very beginning of our passage in verse 6, Paul starts this whole thing off this way. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And then he goes on to talk about why we don't need Jesus supplements because, you know, we're baptized Christians and we can be confident that all we need, we already have in Jesus. My friends, Paul sees baptism as a sign and seal of our freedom. 
It shows us that we are free from the tyranny of idols because we have all of God in Jesus. We don't need to look for him in anyone else or in any place else. By receiving Jesus, we get all of God. It shows that we can be free from the feelings of inadequacy that plague us. We can be free from the feeling that we are uh, inadequate to live the Christian life. Beloved, we are not inadequate to live the Christian life because Jesus is pouring himself into us. We can repent of our sins and we can forgive those who sin against us and we can obey and follow Jesus and be faithful. Uh, or as we like to say in the reform world, we are equipped for the Christian life. We are not inadequate because we are made alive in Christ, which is why Paul says we can walk with Jesus. But Matt, sometimes we fail. Yes, and baptism tells you some good news. You are free from the condemnation of sin. Jesus has canceled the record of debt that stood against you with its legal demands, setting them aside, nailing them to his cross, burying them with him. And because you are buried with him, you are free and forgiven. Or as Paul says, you are rooted, built up, and established. And then finally, we are free from the fear of abandonment by God. And this is why I, Paul, I think Paul ends verse 7 with the call to abound in thanksgiving. Jesus will never leave you ever. When you're happy, Jesus is there. When you're sad, Jesus is there. When you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus, the shepherd of the sheep, is with you. And when you're wondering whether that's true, as Martin Luther did, you can say, I am a baptized Christian. Jesus is with me. But of course, maybe you're not baptized. Maybe you want to be. Or maybe you want to discuss this more. Uh, please get a hold of me after service or by phone, you know, by phone, by email, whatever. Let's make some time to talk about this more. But for now, let's just end with this. My friends, we need to say to ourselves more often than we do, I am a baptized Christian. I am a baptized Christian. Uh, but we don't just need to say that to ourselves. We also need to say that to each other. You are a baptized Christian. You can live for Jesus. You are forgiven. Jesus lives with you now. And he will always live with you. So be encouraged that you can live with him. We are baptized Christians. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you that all your fullness dwells in Jesus. Thank you that in him you have forgiven our sins that you've freed us from sin's dominion, that you've raised us to life with Christ, and you've given us the sure hope that nothing in all creation can separate us from you. And thank you for giving us baptism as a sign and seal of all these blessings that Jesus has filled us with. Help us to remember always that we are baptized Christians and that all these blessings are ours because Jesus is ours and we are his. And we are so thankful for this gift. And so we pray this all in his name as well. Enjoy. Amen.